Hello everybody, this is CJ Wiley with more Adventures on the Road. I've been uh, answering some questions lately about uh, aiming, and there's all kinds of different opinions on, on how to aim, which should actually tell you something. You know, if you ask uh, probably 10 professional players how they aim, most of them I won't even be able to tell you. They'll say something like, you know, ghost ball or uh, instinct, imagination, and, uh, you know, which won't tell you a whole lot. But what they're doing that they don't realize is something that I used to do and I didn't realize was their alignment to the balls, their connection from the cue ball to the object ball is something different than what other people are doing. Like, most people are trying to aim the cue ball at a spot on the object ball, or they're trying to aim it at a ghost ball, or so they're trying to hit the cue ball into the object ball at a certain point and create this angle that hits the pocket. So there's like three things going on. If I had to do that, I wouldn't be able to play at all. I would quit tomorrow or today and never play again if I had to do that because it, it just doesn't work very well and it's taxing on the mind plus you don't get that feeling of being connected to the game that I've talked about where you go from you playing the game to the game playing through you that's the key just like uh, musicians will talk about that I mean I was uh a piano player. I played classical music contests and played the trumpet and uh, I never was that great at art. I used to try to draw and that just wasn't my thing but uh, I gave it a shot you know but we all have our own uh, you know personal types of talents but a lot of them can be applied to pool you know if that's the game that you uh, like to play as far as for self-expression and, uh, you know, to get away from the world or a hobby or, uh, or if you like the competition, if you just want to be the best in your town or the best in your state or the best in the country or ultimately the best in the world, uh, that was my goal is to be the number one player in the world. I didn't, uh, I didn't focus on that. Like it wasn't like every day I got up and like, how can I be the best player in the world? I just set my mind to it and, you know, was willing to do whatever it took. And I was very fortunate to be around some of the best players in the world on the road uh, gambling, you know, back then. These days, the uh, players don't have that opportunity. You know, you can't really go on the road gambling and hustling and, and stuff like that. I tell those stories, but uh, I can't... Uh, you know, I wouldn't ever suggest that a player go on the road and uh, and try to hustle pool. <laughs> it's just not not something that can be done. But that's how I did it. You know, when I was 15, I started going on the road and hustling and uh, gambling, and and I started running around with players like uh, you know Rick Thompson was one of my first road partners and. Omaha John, he's the one that really started to make an impression because he was one of the best players in the country, especially on a bar table, and an unknown player, you know, he wasn't really big in tournaments, he was more of a gambler, so um, it was, uh, hey, just a second, <laughs> trying to maneuver around these cars, it's getting a little dark. But, uh, but John's the one I first saw when he went down on the cue ball, how intently he stared at the cue ball going down to it. And he got his hand firmly secure on the table and the point on the tip to the point he was aiming at at the cue ball before he looked at the algae ball. So his eyes would drop down and you could see they were like lasers. And Vernon Elliott was like that. David Matlock was like that. You know, Earl. And, uh, you know, as I, as I got around some of these uh, top-level champion players, I could see they all pretty much had that in common. Now, there are exceptions. I'm not saying there isn't. But the primary aiming that you're doing is to the cue ball. If you can't hit that cue ball precisely, 
you're not going to hit the object ball precisely. So it has to be the priority. So that's where that alignment is so crucial. Because if you're not aligned to the object ball before you get down, you pretty much have to look at the object ball. And then when you get down on the shot, usually with the practice strokes, players will make these micro adjustments to create the angle and they're actually aiming at the shot when they're down on the ball. I don't aim at the shot while I'm down on the ball. I'm more feeling it and uh, trying to connect to it. But I do my aiming above the shot before I get down. And I'm pretty sure uh, most of the champions will say that they do the same thing. And then when, when you get down on the shot, you've got to be really particular about hitting that cue ball precisely. And then another major element is the tempo. You know, the tempo of the stroke is really important because you want to hit that cue ball like at the moment of, of uh, highest acceleration, like popping, we call it like a pop shot, like popping a whip. When you pop a whip, the timing has to be just right so that all of the energy goes into the tip of that whip right at the last possible second. It's like a delayed um, reaction, which causes the tip to pop. It breaks the sound barrier, I guess, is, uh, you know, what's going on. But uh, it takes a lot of timing. And also, like, if you were... Uh, popping a towel it would be the same thing you bring your hand back and go forward and right at the moment right at the last possible moment there's a wrist flick and that pops the towel or pops the uh, whip so anyway I'm gonna pull in here to finish this off <laughs> it's getting dark so uh so that's where it's important to understand the footwork because without doing the footwork correctly, what I'm talking about isn't possible because the right hip is in the way. So what most people do is they stand about three or four inches to the left of the shot line. Their eyes make an adjustment so that they see the ball straight, but they're actually not centered behind it. It's an illusion and you can play like that and, and I played like that, you know, when I was younger, I think. Because when I changed my stance after I became a full-fledged pro, this was really at my first uh, professional tournament, I changed my footwork so that I could shoot straight out of the center of my vision, center of my chest, center of my belt buckle, some people like to think of it as. Um, but the main thing is you start centered and you stay centered. You start balanced. That means when you're above the ball, you're balanced. When you go down on a ball, you stay balanced. Because if you're, if you're off balance above the ball, when you get down, it's going to get worse. And the same thing with being centered. If you're not centered above the shot and you get down, you can get down, you know, centered and, and play the game at a high level, but, but it really takes more... Uh, time to do that. I think the, the players that, that aren't aligned properly, they probably have to play uh, a lot more. I just never was really a practice player. I gambled a lot, but as far as practicing, you know, an hour a day is about as much as I can practice. Getting ready for a major event, I might push it up maybe to two hours. That's just, it's really hard for me to, to practice that long because um, I run out of things to work on you know, and I never practiced my break, you know, that would have been probably what I should have been practicing back then, but uh, I always broke really well, and the better I played, the better I broke, but I never practiced the break like these players do today, and, you know, I'm certainly not saying that was a good thing to do, it, you know, these guys are, are breaking better because they're putting that time in practicing, but the break just wasn't that big a deal uh, back then because, we weren't racking our own balls. You couldn't make a corner ball every time. As a matter of fact, the tournaments uh, at the professional level, you know, we uh, some of the older time players would go in there and, and tap the balls down when they were practicing so that the balls racked uh, tightly and the corner ball didn't go. Because we all were against 
making the corner ball. That's how different the game is today. Now all the players have, have got together and they're trying to make the corner ball every time. And it's like if you can't make the corner ball every time, you really can't compete. And that's, uh, I mean, that's so different than it was uh, when I was growing up because, of course, we're racking for each other and, and we're trying to rack the balls so that the opponent can't make a ball. And that's part of the competition. You know, it's just like a pitcher is pitching the baseball to try to keep the batter from hitting, you know, a uh, home run, <laughs> especially, you know, or to get a hit of, of any kind. So in games like pool and baseball and tennis, you know, I mean, in tennis, you're trying to serve the ball or the opponent can't get it back or, or they hit a weak shot back so you can finish it off. But uh, imagine if you were uh, serving to yourself playing tennis or pitching to yourself playing baseball. It's, it'd make the game too easy. Just like the game of pool is too easy now, I think. And that's why a lot of people are trying to play one pocket. Just because uh, nine ball is just, it's just too, there's nothing to it. And it's not really that interesting to watch because it's just the same stuff over and over. And you don't really see much uh, strategic play. That's why, uh, you know, the shooter dare, when we really bring that out, it's going to solve all those problems. If you haven't seen that game, it's a great game to, to practice and get ready for. It's at shootordare.com, and uh, it teaches how we used to play the, the, the two-shot push-out or, or roll-out. Two-shot shootouts, what we called it. <laughs> uh, my friend Rusty Brandemeyer, Brandemeyer used to call it uh, two-shot roll-around. You know, you'll play some roll around, but, um, but you know, this aiming thing is, uh, there's no real visual aiming systems. You know, there's different ways to do it. There's fractional aiming systems. You can create an angle because if you're lined up center to center on a shot and you angle your cue slightly to the left, it's going to make that object ball go slightly to the right. So that's another thing that I'm doing and uh, I teach people to do is how to create that angle so that uh, it uh, creates the angle at the object ball. Basically, one tip of pivot will change the angle a quarter ball. Two tips will be a half a ball. So if you, went, if you had a center to edge shot, let's just say, like a half a ball hit to make the shot, you could go down center to center, pivot over two tips, and hit it, and you'll have outside English on it, and it will make the shot. If you try to put English on it and aiming at the contact point, you're going to overcut the ball. So you have to have some way to uh, you know, alleviate that problem. And if you wanted to cut the ball a quarter, you could just pivot one tip, and it works the same way to the inside of the ball. So if I, if I stand center to center and go two tips to the right and continue to aim at the center, it will turn a center to center shot into a center to edge shot. If I go one tip, it will turn a center to center shot into a quarter ball hit. See, there's only four major angles off center and four angles off of edge. So there's eight total angles. One of them is straight in. One of them is a half a ball, and one of them would be as thin as you can cut it. And then the other ones are in between. Now, once you go down um, on one of those themes of angles, there is a process where your subconscious will, uh, will hit the center of the pocket. So that part right there, I don't think you can do it uh, consciously. Uh, our subconscious is like a mega computer, so it can do that fine-tuning. I mean, when I'm playing really well, I hit the center of the pocket pretty much every time. That's why I play really well on super tight pockets, because if you hit the center, it doesn't matter. That's what Buddy Hall told me one time. I said, Buddy, how do you play so well on tight pockets? He said, uh, CJ, if you hit the center every time, it doesn't matter. <laughs> But he's also the one that told me to play the game with the edge of my tip, not the center. I'll uh, talk more about that. I've, I've explained that on my, uh, uh, some of my other videos. If you want to know more about my fundamentals, techniques, and systems, uh, 
it's hard to explain some of this stuff, but if you want to see them in videos, go to uh, masteringpocketbillards.com. That website uh, has all of my full instructional videos, and uh, I'm getting ready to upload some more here soon. So if you uh, have any questions, let me know, and you know I'll uh, attempt to answer every question if it's in the comments or whether you're seeing this on Facebook or uh, YouTube, I, uh, I always answer questions that are pool related. If somebody uh, gets off track too far, I won't answer their questions probably ever. <laughs> so anyway, I always like to try to help people, but uh, there are people that like to try to abuse that. And uh, I'm sure you're not one of those type people. So that just goes uh, without saying. Anyway, till next time, this is CJ. Remember, the game is the teacher.